very good morning to everyone who has joined us on Zoom and to those of you watching this session on YouTube. I'm Gayatri and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first panel discussion at the Symbiosis Literary Festival 2023. This panel discussion on traditional knowledge and heritage diplomacy will explore possibilities for the promotion, preservation, exchange, and strategic use of a nation's cultural assets and heritage as a means to foster international understanding and cooperation. I will now invite Dr. Vidya to welcome our esteemed speakers. Thank you, Gayatri. Uh, once again, I welcome the esteemed speakers. We just had a wonderful inauguration uh, at the hands of a virtual inauguration at the hands of Dr. Mashalkar, who spoke about two of his books, uh, Leapfrogging to Pole Vaulting and Exprovement, uh, about exponential growth. It was a treat to listen to him this morning. And now we have uh, erudite speakers who want to speak on traditional knowledge and heritage diplomacy. My dear friend and uh, elder brother, Ambassador Pavan Varmaji, uh, Amina, uh, Aminata Cairo, you've been to Symbiosis earlier and welcome back. And of course, Professor Gautam Desi Raju, uh, who spoke at the International Relations Conference. Uh, I mean, it was an amazing uh, uh, speech at the IR conference. In fact, a scientist speaking on this topic is uh, something that really we all felt from the science stream felt really very happy about. I won't take much time. I'm just here to welcome you on behalf of the Symbiosis International University. The Literary Fest being on in the online mode, you know, there are people who join on the Zoom and many more on the YouTube Live and Facebook Live. So we have a very, very large audience and I can get, I, I've been getting messages since morning that they're enjoying uh, the talk. So over to you, Gayatri. Uh, and thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Vidya. So uh, I will now introduce our esteemed speakers. Dr. Aminata Cairo is an anthropologist, psychologist, educator, and storyteller. So she brings along with her a bag full of stories and experiences. She is a lecturer of social justice and diversity in the arts at the Amsterdam University of the Arts. She became the only lecturer of African descent in the applied university system in the Netherlands. As an international woman of color, she experienced firsthand the challenges of diversity and inclusion and so in her applied anthropological work with students, education and community organizations, she has continually strived to promote inclusion at both the academic and the community level. She received the International Education Faculty Achievement Award and the Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. She, she received the Honorary Doc Order of the Palm a state decoration by the government of Suriname for her contribution to culture. She is particularly interested in using her academic, artistic, and community skills to support, honor, and celebrate the voices and stories that are unheard, overlooked, silenced, and marginalized. Her work is exemplified in her book, Holding Space, a storytelling approach to trampling diversity and inclusion. I must also mention that she cares deeply about working with people, and she describes herself as a love worker. We look forward to hearing you, Dr. Cairo. Our next speaker, Dr. Gautam R. Desi Raju, is a structural chemist who has been associated with the Solid State and Structural Chemistry Unit of the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, since 2009. Before that, he had been at the University of Hyderabad for around three decades. He is currently a distinguished professor at UPES, Dehradun, and is a member of the Academic Council of Rishi Hood University. He has played a major role in the development and growth of crystal engineering. His books on crystal engineering and the weak hydrogen bond in structural chemistry and biology are particularly well known. He is one of the most highly cited Indian scientists and has won, and I will not read out the entire list, but won many international awards. He was also awarded the Acharya P. C. Ray Medal by the University of Calcutta for innovation in science and technology. Dr. Desi Raju is the former president of the International Union of Crystallography. He is the chairman of the governing council of the Bose Institute at Kolkata. He is also the recipient of three honorary doctorate degrees. So, and after gathering all of these feathers in his cap in the scientific world, he decided to have new adventures. So he has deep dived into India's constitutional history to explore the reimagination of India as a civilized, civilizational state 
rather than a nation state, which he offers us in his book, Bharat, India 2.0. A literary festival is also the best place to let you know that Dr. Desi Raju is also working on another book, India's Supply Chains in a Changing World. I welcome Dr. G Dr. Gautam Desi Raju to the Symbiosis Literary Festival and to this panel discussion. Our next speaker, Professor Atul Gokhale, is the director of our very own Symbiosis School of Culinary Arts, a premier culinary and hospitality school at Symbiosis International University. He is an accomplished hospitality and culinary education specialist with over 35 years of experience in India and abroad in the fields of teaching, administration, and the hospitality industry. He also has 20 years of experience in the fields of hospitality, culinary, and tourism education. An alumnus of IHM Bhupaneshwar, he started his career as a chef with ITDC New Delhi. Through his doctoral research, he is developing a maturity model for culinary arts education in India. He has been teaching advanced food history, and he explores gastronomy from a social and anthropological perspective. His research interests are in the areas of Vedic and regional Indian cuisine, food history, recipe history, food flavors, and textual, textures development. Most importantly, if you ever meet him in person, you should know that he specializes in Italian and Indian cuisine. A warm welcome to you, Professor Gokhale. Finally, it gives me great joy to introduce our very own Ambassador Pawan K. Varma who is a much loved, distinguished professor at Symbiosis International University. Ambassador Varma is a writer diplomat now in politics. He has been an MP in the Rajya Sabha, an advisor to the Chief Minister of Bihar. He is the author of over a dozen best-selling books, and just to name a few, The Great Indian Middle Class, Being Indian, Becoming Indian, Adi Shankaracharya, Hinduism's Greatest Thinker, and The Great Hindu Civilization, uh, achievement, neglect, bias, and the way forward. He has been ambassador to several countries, including Bhutan. He has also been the director of the Nehru Center in London, the official spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs, Director General ICCR, and press secretary to the President of India. Ambassador Varma has two honorary doctoral degrees for his contribution to the fields of diplomacy, literature, culture, and aesthetics. In 2012, he was conferred Bhutan's highest civilian award, the Druk Tukse, by His Majesty, the King of Bhutan. He also received the Kalinga International Literary Award in 2019. Can I, can I request Mr. Pawan Varma to take over the session? She's just joining, sir. Please. Well, thank you very much, Janet. It gives me really great pleasure to be a participant in the Symbiosis Literary Festival, I consider Symbiosis a second home, and it gives me great pride at the excellence it has achieved as a center of education and thought. Uh, I also welcome a very distinguished panelists. I feel a bit dwarfed by their overwhelming credentials in fields in which I am a complete novice. I'm a bit of a dilettante, a jack of all trades, master of none. But uh, I have had experience in diplomacy and I have worked extensively on uh, Indian civil language. And therefore, I think this subject today is uh, particularly apt because we are talking about the link between diplomacy and traditional heritage. I think what we need to remember first is that India is a young nation, but it's a very ancient civilization. And this link between what a young nation does and what it has inherited as a civilization cannot be erased, must not be erased, and must become a part of the overall projection we make 
in the field of diplomacy in order to strengthen our credentials in terms of credibility. So let me say to begin with that uh, I think we must rank, and I'm not, I'm speaking of India, but I'm also making a general point. We must rank among the most ancient civilizations in the world. Uh, new research, new technology establishes that uh, at least five to six thousand years before the BCE, we had already emerged as a civilizational uh, and verifiable entity with a certain worldview. And that is important. If any of you have read the Rig Veda, which is dated sometime around uh, 3500 BCE, you will see already that the central pillars of our civilizational heritage are reflected there. Because the Rig Veda, which is considered a sacred document, is not a set of fiats. It's not a set of dictums. It's a rumination, an inquiry, an interrogation on what this universe is. And subsequently, the evolution of this civilization was essentially an eclectic and inclusive uh, we have, we have, as you all know, some Mahavakyas, great sentences from the past. Uh, one of them from the Rig Veda is the motto of this university, Vasudheva Kutumbu. The world is one family, Udara Charitanam Vasudheva Kutumbu. For the big hearted, the entire world is a family, a thought that was articulated at a time when most emerging communities believed that those who constitute it are the limitations of their world. We had thinkers and sages whose vision was far broader. And there are many other such sayings. Let good thoughts flow to me from all directions. And so therefore, this British conceit colonial conceit that they created in India is something that is clearly a deceit and factually untrue. Uh, this civilization existed, in fact, thousands of years ago in one of our texts called the Puranas, we have a, a fairly accurate description of what is India today through the notion of Bharatvarsh, where it actually describes even physically the map of India extending from the Himalayas in the north to the oceans in the south, uh, almost to the exact mile. And so, therefore, this question of whether we were a civilization or a unified entity before the British came may be politically correct in the sense that nation states only came into being after the Treaty of Westphalia in the 17th century. But civilizations have existed much before. And having, therefore, established that Puranas, in fact, spell out a sacred geography of what this civilization is. If that factor is established, and then we speak about the diplomacy of a young nation in a modern world, we cannot erase the link, which essentially consists of optimizing some of the wisdoms of the past or some of the accumulated knowledges of the past. Not that I'm saying the past was entirely unblemished. There was much that needed change, much that later got distorted. 
But nevertheless, this accumulated wisdom in a variety of fields, in a variety of fields, is what constitutes the soft power of India, where heritage and diplomacy are reinforced in their impact by a fuller understanding and projecting of what India's is blessed to have, which is a soft power of a great and ancient civilization. And these wisdoms are in many fields, in philosophy. I don't think there are, I don't say this with any sense of xenophobia or chauvinism, but uh, I think the profundity of thought in the Upanishads, in the Brahma Sutras, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the six systems of Hindu philosophy, uh, which incidentally can be technically called atheists because they're not talking about God. They're trying to discover what is the ultimate truth behind this bewildering cosmos. So, uh, this wisdom in philosophy, in science, and we have Gautam Desurajuji, who uh, is one such product of an ancient lineage of uh, excellence in science. Uh, we, we, we have uh, that wisdom in the field of arts and culture, which has become one of the calling cards of India. Uh, uh, and that is because 600 years before the birth of Christ, Bharat wrote a book called the Natya Shastra, consisting of 6,000 Sanskrit shlokas which are not a compendium of what the arts are, but a meditation on what the aesthetic experience is. Rasa. At a time when, in a great number of places in the world, people have not come down from trees. This is a meditative exercise on what constitutes the aesthetic experience, while the Western conceit is that the word aesthetics derived from a Greek word, was actually made into a science in the 17th century by a British uh, reviewer of art. I'm not going into detail. So whether it's arts, it's culture, it's our notion of ethics, it's political science. Uh, many people believe that Kautilya's or Chanakya's Shastra is the only book, but he mentions that there were dozens of books before that and at least nine schools, nine systems of political philosophy existing in India uh, in the field of medicine. And again, we have uh, uh, a very distinguished panel, but uh, I'm not saying all these uh, wisdoms in the area of medicine are entirely valid today. Some of them need to be validated, scientifically tested. But there was an entire corpus of thought on what constitutes the body, the Ayurved system, the Unani system. These have come down to us from ages. And today, if you add to this yoga, medical tourism and our calling card in diplomacy has become a very important aspect which links this heritage with, with, with diplomacy. Uh, we have, uh, of course, historical monuments. Uh, there is, uh, as I cannot but mention with uh, Mr. Gokhale here, food. Not food in its variety, but the philosophy behind food. Which foods make what changes to your body and in what measure they should be eaten and in what combination? I mean, there was a, the whole thing was that there was a great application of mind. So, with all of these things, and uh, one other thing I want to mention before I end my introductory remarks, which is that a lot of this was enriched subsequently by assimilation. We had uh, the Muslim conquerors who initially did uh, inflict great destruction. But ultimately, in spite of that, they became a part of the 
uh, texture of Indian civilization and contributed greatly to music, to food, to language, to poetry, to sartorial wear. And that is what we now call Ganga Jamuni Tezib, which is the name of two rivers, Dr. Cairo, where both ultimately meet and mix and assemble and form a syncretic and composite culture. So uh, there is diversity. And that diversity today needs to be preserved in a globalized world which believes in the myth that we have all become mirror images of each other. We have not. Within a globalized world, we need to preserve that diversity, build upon it, and include it in our diplomacy as UNESCO indeed advocates, so that we have the recognition of heritages in the conduct of diplomacy. Now, how nations do that is something I would like the panel to discuss. I believe India has not fully leveraged its soft power. For instance, the budget of the British Council is perhaps equal to the budget of our entire foreign office, the Gate Institute, even China now with the Confucius Institutes, the Cervantes Institute. I mean, nations invest money in projecting their soft power to reinforce their diplomacy in a far more widespread, institutionalized, and resourceful way. India is still lagging behind, even though perhaps we are richer than most countries in this area. So that is something also we, we need to do. I will uh, stop here, and I will invite uh, our panelists to express their thoughts uh, from their various disciplines. My request would be that each of you speak for about 10 minutes, after which there could be an interaction between us and some space for questions and answers. So let me first begin with uh, the eminent lady in our group, Dr. Kyle. Dr. Kyle. Good morning, and thank you for the wonderful introduction. I have to start a particular way, uh, coming that my people are originally from Suriname, and it goes like this. The song says, stick your ear out, because there is a story burning inside your belly, and the story is burning uh, to come out. I'm going to share a PowerPoint. I don't want this to be a very academic lecture because I really want to engage people, but I do. I am going to uh, share a PowerPoint with you to kind of guide us. So again, thank you. I really appreciate what you shared about India being a young nation and at the same time, but an ancient civilization. And as I think about this, this young nation, um, and as I think about how I have been trained as an anthropologist, um, I was born and raised in the Netherlands. I was born and raised in Europe. And then I went to the United States where I did all my academic training. So as far as when it comes to knowledge, what I was fed with, when you talk about a colonial legacy from, from, from the cradle <laughs> all the way through, that's the kind of knowledge I was exposed to. However, especially when I was in college and I found what I call indigenous knowledge, that was something that resonated within me. That's something that made sense with me. In, as far as my heritage coming from Suriname. And um, and that's something that I quickly want to share about. And as far as put it a little bit in a context, as far as that role of traditional or indigenous knowledge. And I'm going to quickly just talk through some of these, because I'm sure this audience is very familiar with this. But as we're talking about ontology, epistemology, methodology, and, and, and axiology, as we're thinking about knowledge and how we deal with knowledge. And so there's several strengths that I was um, introduced to in, in my education. And so we have positivism. And so in positivism, the ontology as far as how do we think about what is. 
and positivism you are exposed to that there's an ultimate reality that can be broken down into overriding laws. And when it comes to these approaches that I'm going to share with you, it shapes um, not only as far as what we've been introduced to when it comes to knowledge, but then also how we think about thinking about and how we think about methodology about the how should we explore what are the methods that we're going to use or what are the ethics that we're going to use in our work so again with positivism the idea was there's an ultimate reality that can be broken down overriding laws and I'll leave the rest here just for now and, and, and quickly go through the other so then you had post-positivism saying that there's an ultimate reality but research and researchers are too imperfect um to get to that reality. And so the goal is still to be objective, but we realize that, that it can never be achieved. And so as far as the methodology, then we have these scientific goals of validity and reliability, but this introduction in of qualitative research. We have critical theory, where we now shifting to that reality is more fluid or plastic than, one, than a fixed truth. And it has been shaped by cultural, gender, social, and other values. And so researchers, they influence what they study, they influence the subject and their equality through their interaction with it, and that they can help mold reality because of their own influences. Um, so the pursuit of knowledge is not the goal, but changing the reality is. Then we have constructivism, where there are many realities to the different people and location that hold them. And so reality is what you make it to be. And again, I'm, I'm just giving the, the watered, watered down version of this. And so this interaction is important to get to this reality um, that is socially constructed and shared. And so when it comes again to the methodology that we see this progression, uh, you see this introduction, again, this holding of, of qualitative next to quantitative methodology, and that this role of interaction is very important. And then in terms of axiology, knowledge is not the ultimate goal, again, but changing reality is, and that we can be um, need this to in, improve the reality of its participants. And so there's this common thread in all of them as we see this progression of, of these different ways of engaging knowledge. And the common thread among all of them is that it's still very individual in nature. So even as we move to being more critical, even as we're moving to being constructive, it's still about the individual and the indiv how the individual stands in the world and engages with knowledge. And so when we compare it to an indigenous paradigm, it is not about the individual, but that it's about us and being part of the world and that knowledge is seen as belonging to the cosmos and that it's always relational and that we are a part of this engagement with knowledge and that we are not owners, but we are shepherds or stewards of knowledge. And so how do we stand open? How do we stand in connection and in relationship to this knowledge? And so it's a, so it's a very different approach. And, and what has happened, and this is language that I use, is as there are these wealths of knowledges, as, uh, as there are these wealths of stories that are there, there is a story that has risen that has become the dominant. Um, that has become the dominant norm. Well, of course, we're going to do it this way. And of course, you know, our research has to be evidence-based, et cetera, et cetera. And for instance, there's nothing wrong with evidence-based, but evidence-based is just one measure of engaging knowledge. And so I use the language of dominant and, and the other to show again that there's a wealth of knowledge that's out there, but there's a knowledge that has risen, that has become normal, the dominant, validated, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens to those, those other ways of engaging knowledge, those other stories that become less than, overlooked, silenced, oh, well, that's cute, extracurricular, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so when we're talking about traditional knowledges, these knowledges that have been here for forever, as was just shared with us, um, it is considered other, it is considered different in the way I was trained. That's cute, that's interesting, but it's not real. I come from a culture, if you wanna know, you go to your grandmother, you go to your auntie, you go sit with that tree. And, and, and so we know that's out there, but it's still considered other, and therefore it's still considered less than. And so in my work, the challenge is how do we validate these knowledges, the, the wealth of knowledges that we have, these wealth of knowledges that were already here, um, that are actually precursors. And what we are fighting against 
is this invalidation of these other wells of knowledge. It's not that we know that they're there, but it's, oh, it's cute. Oh, it's not really valid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we're fighting against. And so even as I think about the term diplomacy, I still even there, I think about that it comes from a dominant perspective. Now we're going to allow you to come in. Well, we were already here. <laughs> and, and, and so what you get often is like, you know, we're to point out that we are aware of these differences and you want to hear about these other knowledges and you can come, but come in a way that's tolerable to me. Come in a way that I understand. Come and adjust and adapt to my way as opposed to these ways were already here. And if we're going to expand our storyscape, if we're going to expand our knowledge scape, rather than you have to come and do it my way, we have to interweave and expand um, how we engage with knowledge together. And so, you know, so in my work, again, coming from a particular Western trained background, I, I in, introduced this idea of indigenous or traditional knowledge and the starting point is always, you know, what I share is that we believe we are connected to anything and everybody at any given time. So our starting point is that it's always about us. It's never about them and those. There's no them and those. There's us. Some of us always have the right to speak. Some of us always go first. Some of us are always validated. Some of us are overlooked, silenced, marginalized. But in the end, it's always about us and how we stand in relationship to each other. And in particular, through a particular colonial history, there are mechanisms that have contributed to that and there are mechanisms that hold that in place. And so those are the mechanisms that we have to uh, disrupt as you, uh, as you will. And so an important part of that, how we then engage this world is through stories. How do we interweave our stories? How do we expand the stories that are there? How do we validate the stories, the wealth of knowledge that is out there? And so we are at the and, and so we are at a point now where there is some awareness um, of this, these inequities. There's, there's a lot of awareness. And like I said, and still it's like, yes, we want to hear your story, but adapt to us. Or we want to hear your story, but it has to be in, in, our, in our way. And so as much as I love storytelling and I believe and that we have to share stories, I also always stress just because you want the story doesn't mean you're entitled to it. Because we now are at the point where from the dominant perspective, we're saying, yes, we want to hear your story and you can come. But these people have learned, you know, <laughs> can I trust you with my story? If I share my story, will you honor it? Or will you just consume it? Or will you just take part of it, you know, and then make it your own? You, know, you just mentioned yoga, you know, especially in the West. What has happened to yoga? The tourism people come to India and then they start setting up their yoga practices. I, you know, what are you doing with my store? You're coming to take, to consume. And then, you know, um, and I'm sure there are people doing good work, but again, as there is a hesitancy, you know, as far as how are we going to share, how are we going to honor the stories that are already there and treat them in the right way. I don't wanna um, share, this is a person that has been an inspiration of me. It's a native person from Canada, Sean Wilson who wrote the book, Risha's Ceremony. And so he talks about the three R's. He talks about when you engage knowledge, um, you have to have respect, you have a certain responsibility, and it has to be reciprocity. So he calls that relational ethics. And so that's something when I work with my students that I, that, I, that I share with them. So when we engage, when we explore knowledge, it cannot just be about taking, it cannot just be about consuming. But how are you respectful? How are you going to honor? What is the responsibility to the people that you work with, but also to your craft? And is there reciprocity? Again, you cannot just come and take. Um, and I I'm, I'm, I'm want to be very conscious of my time. And so I have listed some scholars here to consider. And I'm, there are many, many more. These are some of the ones that I was first introduced to. Sean Wilson that I just men mentioned. Linda Tui Y. Smith which also talks about research and she's from, uh, she's Maori, George C. Faday, um, who, um, who is in, in Canada um, and, and several of uh, other American, Native Americans. So I just uh, kind of want, want to leave it there as far as, again, my experience, um, my appreciation. And when I think about the diplomacy, um, one of the questions or one of the challenges I see, again, is that we are aware that these knowledges are there 
but how do we make sure that we don't just ap approach them from a dominant perspective? How don't, do we, don't we just say, yeah, you can come, but please come in a way that's suitable and that's tolerable to me as opposed to accommodating. And, and we have to figure out um, a different way of engaging and creating to collectively a different playing field to honor those knowledges. And I will leave it at that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kaido. That was welcome. extremely interesting. It reminded me of what originally began with Dr. Edward Said, uh, yes. which is to understand yes. that it's an asymmetrical world. Yeah. And, uh, and therefore, how to create that level playing field, mm -hmm. not only in theory, but in practice. Yes. Uh, there again, uh, the key factor is recognition mm -hmm. of diversity and mm -hmm. its validity, mm -hmm. uh, not merely tolerance, but to internalize it, to accept it, to respect it. Mm -hmm. and so I think that's a very valid point. And thank you so much for your very, You're very, very thoughtful presentation. Uh, Dr. Desiraju uh, from uh, one area to the rarefied world of of the kind of science you do, which none of us understand, but which no doubt is related to very, very deeply to the subject we are discussing. I request you for your remarks. Thank you, Ambassador Verma, for these very kind words. It's a pleasure and honor to me with Dr. Cairo and Professor Gokhale in this session and uh, in the 10 minutes allotted to me, I hope to at least mention one example where a scientific subject actually impinges on the topic under discussion today. So traditional knowledge and heritage diplomacy, I mean, the chairman of this session is a Doyen diplomat of several decades. And so it is with a certain particular sense that I undertake uh, some of my comments. Today, as India is gradually becoming Bharat, I call this a Triveni moment. There are three distinct streams of thought and action that are coming together in our country today. These are the economic, cultural and political streams. And in all the three cases, the country is seeing rapid advances or at least increased awareness of these issues. Now, if you look at world history, several countries have seen one or two of these things happening simultaneously. But India of 2023, we are seeing actually all three at the same time. We see the economic growth. We are something a little under 4 trillion, they say. And so that we will get to 5 trillion by 26 or something like that. And 7 to 8 trillion by 2030, unless there are some big black swan moments. And then we have the maturity of political thought. We have gone through 50 years of coalition rule. And from an early stage when we had a single party rule, we again seem to be stabilizing in a single party rule with all the implications that that has. And finally, and important from this particular discussion, the cultural awakening. We've already heard enough about the civilizational state and Indian knowledge systems, and the fact that plenty was known in this country. I would say that we went through, you know, starting with the Rig Veda, let us say magic, metaphysics, medicine, materials, metallurgy, you know, we came through this whole sequence and uh, we were pretty good at it by the time, let us say, in the first or second century uh, CE. So the thing is that can we bring these things back, the word soft power was mentioned, and I hope to say something about how soft and hard power can sort of, we need them together actually. You can't have soft power by itself. Now, <clears throat> statesmen and administrators 
cannot afford to ignore geography. The word geography was already mentioned. Cannot ignore geography and therefore geopolitics. This is something that they have to be aware of, at least in the modern world. That's the first point I wanted to say. The second point is I want to make a quotation from a scholar of Mysore University whose name is practically unknown, S. Srikanth Shastri. In the 1940s, believe it or not, he has actually written a book where he talks about an Indian supranational union, 43, when partition discussions were still going on and so on. He talks about an Indian supranational union. And Professor Srikant Shastri says, and I quote, in the history of the world, it is only Hinduism that gave not only to India, but also to all her neighbors, an organic conception of society based upon economic as well as spiritual needs. So already the linking of economy and spirituality is coming in. And so the three triveni things, economy, culture and politics, they must all be taken together. These are not individual silos anymore. Our ancients knew they were not silos. Without Artha, you cannot uh, practice Dharma in the end. So, Chanakya also says similar things. So, we always know there is a deep connection between economics, politics and culture. Now, and he says actually in 43, he says the immediate interest has centered around the problem of winning independence and preserving political unity. Written in 43. But India cannot afford to be indifferent to the wider questions of an international world order. This world order came in the form of the UN, which went in a particular way, which is not entirely advantageous to India, which was still a small country then. It wasn't even independent. Now, the question is, in the tradition of India and its history, there is a natural affinity of India with its neighbors. Now, so the particular point and the discussion today is most applicable to our immediate neighbors. And this is the um, particular sphere I want to talk about. This is Bharat Varsha of your, of the Vedas and the Rishis. And this is where our cultural influence is most dominant. And I do believe that this is where we should try to leverage our economic interests. We may not be interested in some of these places politically or only marginally so, but certainly this is our immediate economic areas. And the question is, how can we leverage the cultural aspects to improving economy with some of these places? That is, that is the question which I believe diplomats should face. And I will come to now the scientific point which I said I would mention. Uh, just two weeks ago, uh, I was in uh, Darjeeling right here. And I was in the company of a famous microbiologist in India. So we were talking about the great uh, similarity in thinking between people in India, Bihar, Nepal, Tibet, Bhutan, Sikkim, Bengal, even Myanmar, Assam, China. And so he said, he gave a very nice analogy. You see, I want to tell you a little bit about protein structure. Proteins do all the things we have, we have to for life, to maintain life in the body. And proteins are connected by linking up amino acids in a particular order. So depending on the order in which you link those amino acids, the protein has a certain shape and a certain function. Now, the interesting thing is, it is seen when you look at a large number of proteins. When the amino acids are in the same positions, let us say to about 30% of the extent between two proteins. You've got two proteins and 30% of the amino acids are in the same position it appears that at 30% homology, this is the word I wanted to introduce, homology. At 30% homology, there is not much similarity in the activity of these two. Ah. 
by the time you go up to 40% homology between two proteins, practically all the properties of these proteins are the same. So you see there is a sudden rapid non-linear change between 30 and 40% homology. So what my colleague told me was, he said the homology between all these areas is at least 60%. So without worrying about small differences between these areas, all the people in these areas, he says, and I quite believe him, think broadly in the same kind of way. And if a civilization is going to be characterized by how people think, for example, nationality in Bharat is largely a matter of how we think. It is not, it's not, not something that comes by blood or ethnicity or religion and things like that. And the manner of thinking, the manner of thought is the same and the homology levels are very high. These become a natural playing ground to extend our diplomatic coverage. Now, this is the immediate neighborhood. If you want to talk about Mandala, this is the first circle. This is the first circle around the central core of Bharat. Now, let's go to the extended area, which is, now you see, I've taken the old area and then I'm going into Southeast Asia. And certainly we know that there are cultural similarities here. Once again, the political part, I am not so worried about for today. But certainly our economic footprint, our supply chains, this is the part of the world that is going to be very important in the future. Now that we see the atmosphere declining in so many ways, when you look at what is happening in Europe today, especially the entire thing that started with individualism, the Industrial Revolution, the thinking of Rousseau and people like that, the importance given to individuals as opposed to society. See, they, they are now paying the price for doing all these things for 250 years. And this part of the world, which is seen in this particular map, is going to be ever so important. And this brings me now, I've told you about homology. The fourth point, which I wanted to mention, Ambassador Verma has already mentioned. What have we been doing about this possible cultural imprint that we can have in this region, practically nothing. So, he talked about the Confucius Institutes and things like that. Uh, China is miles, miles ahead of us in this kind of thing. Now, we've got so much. He correctly pointed out we've got so much and yet we are not doing practically anything about it. Okay, some Japanese pilgrims come to Bodhgaya. You know, they're very happy to go to Ajanta and Elora and things like that. But this is not, you know, extending our diplomatic coverage through our culture. And coming back again to the idea of homology, if you take these countries, this, you see, today I can say what we are doing is having international garden picnics. This is not, this is not to my mind, any way in which we can go from soft power to hard power. And hard power back to soft power because these two things must be taken together. You cannot take them separately in my mind. So then my last point which I want to mention is how do we convert cultural similarity into diplomatic leverage? You know, we've got the cultural similarity. Now what are we doing about it? Now, if you take India, modern day political India, post-47, we've got a number of small neighbors and at best, these neighbors may be neutral towards us. Ambassador Verma, having been in Bhutan for many years, will probably be able to educate us much more than I can, who only relies on information in the public domain. But whether you take Nepal or Bhutan, certainly Bangladesh, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Forget our neighbor to the immediate west. There is a separate case which has to be taken up separately, probably in a separate program in the lit fest. So let I'm not going to talk too much about Pakistan. But if you go to all these places, there's a certain amount of neutrality bordering on mild friendship here and there. But none of them are our close friends. 
So maybe they have a point because this is a very big country and they're all little countries. So there will be a certain amount of anxiety. But I do want to take Sri Lanka as a specific example. Now, the Sri Lanka place is uh, certainly we have got the cultural similarity. The two major religions of Sri Lanka are covered in India. We, we have a language affinity. Sinhala is very, very close to the Indo-European languages, very similar to Malayalam and Telugu especially. So we do have that. Now, but what are we doing? What are the particular things we can do? We can digitize their Buddhist manuscripts. They probably have a whole lot more than we do. And the previous lecture from Dr. Mashelkar, which we heard, the whole business about digital India and where we are going. I think this is where we can then come and we are not even doing it with our own manuscripts. Let us start with the Sri Lankan ones. And so we can digitize them. What we can certainly do is to train their monk novitiates. We have to start at the lowest levels in any kind of cultural influence. I've always felt in science too, that it's best to talk to the people at the base level because they will be tomorrow's leaders. So there's no point in talking to very, very senior people who may retire and go home happily in a few years. So we need to get to younger people, religious people in Sri Lanka and persuade some of the bigger Buddhist leaders in Sri Lanka, for example. Our main rival in Sri Lanka is China, who's doing all sorts of things there. We are also doing, I know. But they have been there at this game longer than us in Sri Lanka. Now, if suppose we are able to convince senior Buddhist monks in Sri Lanka, that somehow they have to convey to the people of Sri Lanka that Bharat is a dharmic country and China is an adharmic country. If this kind of a cultural message can be conveyed to people in Sri Lanka, I am sure that there will be a groundswell of support. There will not be antagonism towards us ever. Let us forget about that equation with China. They may do whatever they want. But the relationship with India, they will feel more comfortable, more friendly, more familiar. Ambassador Verma has probably been to Sri Lanka many a time. I visited only once for a week in Colombo for a scientific conference in 2014. I found that the knowledge of the faculty and the students about India was abysmal. They vaguely knew about the DMK. That DMK word they knew. And uh, they didn't even know where Hyderabad was. They didn't know it was a big city. And all of them were very keen on, the students were very keen on going abroad and pursuing their studies in the UK. So I told some of them, why don't have you ever considered uh, doing your higher studies in India, in one of the IITs or something? No, they didn't even know anything. It was not a case that they didn't like us, but there was total ignorance. And I felt quite disappointed at the end of one week. If this is what our Sri Lanka policy is, you know, you know the famous story that uh, Stalin apparently told one of our ambassadors who showed him a map of India and he said, what's that small thing below? So the guy had to tell him that this was an island called Sri Lanka and then this was another country. I believe Stalin said, why? So, I mean, this is, this, this is an example of, you know, where probably we could do something. My last thing which I would say before I conclude is about the Muslim countries and Islam. Ambassador Verma has again mentioned the Ganga Yamuna Taisi. And I think there's a fair amount of literature and knowledge that Muslims in India are quite different from Muslims in Pakistan and Bangladesh. So many, many Muslims in India have now come into the national mainstream. And so there is no question of othering all the 225 Muslims of this country. There is no question about it. So, I think in the case of Islam, the gov present government is making a lot of inroads in the Gulf countries. I mean, they're building a Hindu temple in one of those Gulf countries. So, I think what one can do is, excluding Pakistan, I think serious efforts have to be made. Maybe through the Sufis in uh, Bangladesh, 
I don't want to get too much into the topic of Sufis, whether they are totally peaceful or partly violent towards Hindus. But whatever may be the case, any possible chance to reach out to Muslims in the neighboring countries should be done. Another place where I think we can really make an outreach with Muslims is to look at Muslims of Indian origin in, say, the UK, the USA, and so on. Because we know that people from Pakistan are doing all sorts of things. But once again, I would beg to state that the behavior of Indian Muslims in the UK may be different from the Pakistani Muslims in the UK. So I think we should do things like what China is doing. For example, shadow police stations to encourage some of our Muslims there, to make them feel more secure in the UK, to feel that they can still have a link with India of some sort. These may be people who are going to stay in the UK forever. But once again, they should be always told that their original home was Bharat, it was India. So I think these are the points. I will just conclude by saying this was the book that I wrote and which was referred to in the introduction by the Vice Chancellor of Symbiosis. So some of these ideas are given here. And as I said, as India is becoming Bharat, we must leverage our great cultural heritage to take the soft power, make it hard power, then use the hard power to get more soft power. These things go around in a cycle. So thank you very much once again, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Dr. Desi Raju. It was most insightful. And there are many questions I would like to ask you. But I think we'll have the brief discussion subsequently. Uh, I now invite uh, Atul Gokleji to move to an entirely different field. Before he begins, I want to say that if our heritage is used in diplomacy, restricted only to Bollywood and Chicken Tikka, then I think we are somewhat undervaluing that diplomacy. So I'm particularly happy that you are investigating food beyond the lowest common denominator. Not that I don't like chicken tikka. But I now invite you to give your comments. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Pavan Varmaji, uh, Professor Desi Raju, and uh, Dr. Cairo. Good to be on this panel, and thank you, Symbiosis, for uh, allowing me also to be on this panel to speak about something which has never been taken as seriously as a part of uh, the general diplomacy and the kind of in depth of the traditional knowledge we have in our Indian civilization. So let me begin with just saying that today I'm going to talk in three stages. First, I'll talk about the uh, heritage diplomacy, which was there from our civilization from the past. A part of it probably during the uh, before the independence and post independence and i'll also look at something what can be done as we go along uh, now and then i'll focus on the traditional knowledge specifically from food as the, dr pavan varma mentioned about the ayurveda and how it has been uh, a part of us which has been investigated which has a proven abilities for the uh, health wellness and nutrition. So as uh, Professor Desi Raju said, India is Bharat. And that was something which uh, we were uh, known as. And as I say, India never conquered any nation by uh, attacking them. But we conquered the world through the soft power of our food, spices, and the trade which we did for so long, almost thousands of years ago. And we have been continuing that. I'll share my experiences of uh, when I was in Gulf for almost a decade, specifically in Bahrain uh, and in Saudi Arabia, as well as I had a connect in Oman. So when we talk to those people over there, traditionally the old people, uh, before the pet discovery of petroleum, their main trade for all Arabs was essentially trading the goodies from the entire Middle East and Arab world to this part of the east side of the world, to India and Indonesia and other countries. 
and trading them for what we had a huge i would say the knowledge tradition and trade of spices spice or the spice route was one of the three important areas uh, apart from scents and silks i say three ss which were the catalyst of world trade in the ancient times which also resulted in a great heritage diplomacy transfer of knowledge transfer of food and transfer of so many cultural aspects of art music and everything which transferred between different civilizations if i look at the uh, the spice trade which was an important part which it transited from very uh, deep into indonesian islands to the uh, absolute uh, on the western side up till egypt in cairo uh, through the sea routes and majority of this was routed through india with the kind of spices which were traded for money for many other things which india got from other nations arabs were the middlemen who actually tra uh, traded these across by traveling through the sea routes which were the main or, or routes where the food was or other spices was traded with china did it with silk and probably india also was a part of it and the arabs traded with the scents and the scents the, the, the raw material for the scents essentially came from india but eventually i mean as, as i see the entire tradition of 1000 years when these were there the experiences the bahrainis or the omanis always share is the kind of a respect they had for indians before the petroleum discovery in these uh, gulf countries happened majority of their economy was also based on the spices being traded from here and then the knowledge and the kind of uh, uh, the the cultural respect they had for india whether it was for music or art or any other kind of a thing was way too high during that period of time before independence this was the condition thereafter it all came into being uh, the petroleum was discovered india had its own challenges india had to serve its own population the policies of agriculture and everything changed in soft power was never been taken as especially from the food point of view uh, taken as one thing which was there and i give my experience of uh, working in the indian hotels specifically in the india tourism development corporations ashok hotels which was the primary hotel group in india during 70s and 80s and indian uh, tourism ministry would only do what we call as customary indian food festivals and i think uh, mr verma will uh, vouch for this that these were once in a year activities being performed in the european and the american continents or at the most in some other uh, far east nations or in russia food was never ever taken as a serious factor for uh, the uh, heritage diplomacy in the post india post independent india i but now believe that over a period of time we have realized this factor globalization experimentation on food indians traveling abroad has now taken uh, an, an nri population across the entire globe has really uh, given us a weight for taking the indian food or the gastronomy scene to a large extent to the world people now look at india beyond the spice route or the spices as the only area of uh, being exported from india i would say today we are on the cusp of sharing a traditional knowledge of food specifically from the point of view of health wellness and nutrition today as i sit in front of you and i'm talking to you just take an example of a city like new york every third or a fifth kilometer there is an vedic or an ayurvedic food restaurant <laughs> considered as a fad but 
some of it has some basis of it based on the wellness factor. The eco economic and the cultural part has always been at the forefront and including the politics which is deriving it. But I would say, if we look at Ayurveda and its entire depth of knowledge, and I'll speak more on that now, is because Ayurveda has always treated food as medicine. And it has always understood this fact, and I always go back to our uh, symbiosis motto of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, where we say that uh, apart from wellness for everybody, food is one part which can be transported everywhere. Ayurveda always has been one on the cusp of understanding the fact that food is treated as medicine, where the principle of eating local, eating seasonal, and eating as per your constitution was given a precedence over anything else. Today, with, we are in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where we have two diverse understandings. Globalization is bringing uh, everything to our doorsteps. But we are at the moment not able to translate that in a wellness format. Look at India in the last 20 years. Food, which has been imported in the form of uh, the, I would say, the quick service restaurant, the fast foods, is really damaging our own culture, and specifically in form of food, in, in the way we intake. The entire habits of our, you, we Indians have changing. And uh, Westerners are looking at getting our traditional knowledge of Ayurveda to come to them, to translate that into wellness and nutrition. And I would uh, go back to one important factor that we did, we did have a large amount of lit written literature, uh, like we would say Chanakya had the Arthashastra and then the other literatures being written. In food also, there were so many books which were written, but they have never been explored for its knowledge. One example of it is the Park Darpan by Raja Nal. He classified it through Sanskrit shlokas, the aspects of eating well, eating right, and how to go about things. Never ever he was, uh, he, he, he translated that through shlokas as to how an important part of our daily diets can be. For example, uh, the making of ghee, the making of, uh, or maybe setting up of curd using the cultures which are there. These knowledge today, we are not able to translate it and we are using cultures in our food or other culture in making the yogurts and other things which are not appropriate. If I look at, uh, as Ambassador Verma and before that, you know, Professor Mashelkar said about, he fought about basmati rice and uh, the uh, turmeric being preserved and turmeric being taken. Indian uh, foods from the regional areas, for example, uh, I'll take an example of uh, the Pakhara Bhat from Odisha, the probiotic which it is, or the ferments from different as different parts of is regional India have never been explored. Today, the probiotic of a Pakhara Bhat, which is a fermented rice, is being patented by a German company and being exported to us in the form of a probiotic for our own uh, diets to be making them regulated. All these have always resulted into what I call as uh, we losing and not preserving our own traditional knowledge of Indian food. As uh, Pawan Varmaji said, chicken tikka in Bollywood. I would come to that point as chicken tikka and uh, maybe I would say butter chicken and naan are not Indian food. Neither is only dosa idli and sambar. Indian food, Indian traditional food, Indian regional food has always been much beyond that. India, every 25 kilometers has been having a variety of uh, foods, but all of it has a very basis which would take it to a level where uh, I would say they're all intertwined. And as Professor Desaraju said, culturally, we are all connected. 
through that wide map encompassing on the west the afghanistan pakistan and probably even the gulf countries to the east uh, the, the, uh, including the thailand and cambodia and malaysia vietnam and all other countries we are culturally connected our foods have been very common in these but we have never taken them uh, specifically from india today has never done it but i think the geopolitical situations are changing and i believe today apart from preserving the indian uh, traditional knowledge system for food we can use this as a soft power for making influence on the entire world and i stop over here uh, thank you so much that was quite fascinating and i always believe now i'm going to ask our moderator gayatri because it's already 1 o'clock uh, should we end here by my concluding comments or would you do you think we have time for questions because it's 1 o'clock already now right so since it is a panel so you are the moderator sir you are the esteemed speaker moderator i am only the mc but um, but i think because it's a panel discussion it would be wonderful if you all have a few questions for each other if you all would like to pose those um we can maybe let for me five take another one hour <laughs> let me tell you right and right I don't think anyone has the patience to sit because i have so many questions correct but i, I think understand it's a very good beginning Right. We are moving on a very important subject, and if you would agree, and if the other panelists agree, uh, why I thank them with a few concluding comments uh, and any uh, uh, important intervening comments that anybody would like to make. We should wrap up this rather than uh, prolong it beyond its time, because I know a festival is on, and yes. I attend so many. Timing is very important. So, would you agree, Gayatri? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Before, before I start, I think uh, Dr. Desiraj, you wanted to say something. Is that no, right? I just felt that as a moderator, you can please moderate it in most appropriate manner, also keeping lunch time in mind. Quite right. Uh, ultimately, it's all food for thought. Oh, so. Yes. <laughs> So let me say that this has been a very interesting discussion. I think what Dr. Cairo raised about the essential asymmetry in the world, uh, she recognized the problem, but we have to find solutions. And uh, those solutions will not come by homilies. Uh, they will need to come by institutionalized change. And we have to see together, collectively, representing different cultures, how that is possible in a world, as I said, where there is no level playing field. But it's a very important point. Uh, traditional knowledge versus assumed knowledge, which uh, is dominant and which we see unfolding every day in our lives affecting our lives because of the nature of technology and the instruments available for the projection of one kind of set of knowledge over the other. I think it is a far bigger problem than we assume, but it needs to be first fully recognized. As regards uh, uh, Dr. Desiraju's very formative culture, I agree with him that there is a natural cultural affinity for if an ancient civilization like India has evolved in the same geographical crucible for thousands of years, it's overflow and impact in the neighboring region and beyond. I mean, Southeast Asia is a very good example and our immediate neighborhood, of course. But uh, I sometimes think that affinity can also be interpreted by a smaller country as dominance. There is an old Chinese saying, why do you hate me? I have not helped you. Uh, which essentially means that uh, smaller countries, although with great overlapping areas in the field of culture, are 
particularly sensitive to uh, uh, giving credit or emphasizing that which they feel has essentially been born in or sourced in another country which is much larger. And that is a problem that has afflicted us with our neighborhood. And incidentally, let me tell you, in spite of the political uh, divisions we have with Pakistan, culture is a huge cementing factor. When I wrote my first book on the poet Mirza Ghalib, long ago, it was published by Penguin, it was a bestseller in Pakistan. But, and I know how much uh, at the level of people-to-people -people contacts culture matters. It's another matter that we have not uh, leveraged that to influence the political narrative enough. And we can. Uh, and the same applies to Sri Lanka, which you very rightly uh, pointed out. Uh, but we must always keep in mind the factor that while we may believe that the knowledge systems that we have, wisdoms, the traditional knowledge that we propagate, while they may have a natural audience in terms of commonalities, there are also sensitivities about acknowledging them or allowing one narrative to dominate the other. And that happens very often, especially with uh, neighbors. Uh, we also need to understand the, the great uh, uh, underlying consequences of globalization. At one level, uh, as I was discussing the other day in symbiosis, uh, globalization has, has, in a sense, brought us closer. The whole world, we talk of a global village. But on the other hand, uh, globalization also steamrolls valid diversities. And sometimes uh, we need to be vigilant about it. I remember I was in Hungary in Budapest uh, speaking to someone very senior in the government hierarchy. And he was, we were walking in one of their most famous squares along the Danube. And he said to me, your Excellency, here was a restaurant serving Hungarian cuisine from a certain part of our country. And here was a restaurant which was serving Hungarian cuisine in a certain part of our country. And so on and so forth. And then he showed me that how each of them had been now replaced by McDonald's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and pizzas, uh, uh, which is something that Dr. Gokhale, Professor Gokhale referred to. So uh, in Japan, I was with the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, who turned to me looking very worried. He said, uh, Mr. Varma, I have a feeling that we are losing Japanese culture. And I said, what has happened? Because Japan is still, in many ways, traditionally, at least visibly, still part of a certain cultural tradition. And he said to me something that completely jolted me. He said, you know, our young have stopped using chopsticks because of the inroad in such overwhelming uh, impact of fast food. And he says, if in Japan there are no chopsticks, where is the culture? And similarly, in Russia, I was talking to the president of the uh, academy who was very worried, very worried. He told me that with this new elite which has come up in Russia, very rich, it sends its children to study in the best educational institutions in the West. And he says, you know, I think uh, we are facing a genuine national crisis. We talk of national crisis in political terms. Here is a man who was saying we are facing a national crisis because the young in our country are learning English rather than the great legacy, the huge corpus of Russian literature. 
So there is in globalization this great challenge of how we maximize its potential while preserving diversity and from old and ancient civilizations which so many of us belong to uh, we need to stress on our knowledge systems our heritage and make them more vigorously a part of our diplomacy in creative and innovative ways not mechanical uh, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Gokhale, this once a year food festival. I need people like you and Mr. Desiraju and Dr. Kairut, and she does it I'm, as a profession, to go out and explain the philosophy behind that ultimate product, the amount of thought which has gone into it. And only then can we have a convincing narrative not the ad hoc exhibitionism that often happens so uh, uh, lastly i fully agree with uh, again dr desaraju when he says there is a link between soft power and hard power there is there is soft power without the other and hard power without the other really difficult to sustain but the balance and proportion by which you harmonize both, I think, are important. And uh, certainly India is at that cusp where it can actually harmonize both. Uh, it depends, of course, on how well we do it. I would like to thank all of you. And uh, I want to especially thank Dr. Cairo, because she has spent a lifetime pursuing in real terms what all of us have written about or think. And she is a voice that carries by now global conviction. Thank you so much. Right. So I thank Ambassador Varma, Dr. Cairo, Dr. Desi Raju, and Professor Gokhale for giving so generously of their time for this panel discussion. Thank you for offering us a range of insights drawn from their own diverse experiences, reading and research. I thank the audience for joining us from different parts of the world. While we didn't get a chance to go in for an audience q and I'm sure we will have many more sessions at Symbiosis on this particular theme, and we do hope that you will join us there. Thank you all. <laughs>